I don't know. I can text her right now. I'll, I'll, let me call her. Okay. 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 I'll text her. Getting yelled at today. I thought I sat on the mud before. Oh, where do I sort of the mud video? I got the. Right. Since I know we have a very packed agenda, I'll go ahead and call us to order right at the top of the hour. And Andrew, if you would please establish quorum for us. Yes, Madam Chair. Councilor Corrin. Here. Commissioner Shojo Hernandez. Present. Trustee Merrick. Here. Mr. Love. Here. Madam Chair. Here. Madam Chair, we also have Trustee Johnson Burek uh, on the line pending a vote to allow her participation. I would entertain an emo a motion to allow Trustee Johnson Burek to participate virtually. So moved. Corin. Second. Chalger Hernandez. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Corin, seconded by uh, Commissioner Chaljo Hernandez. Yes, Madam Chair. Councillor Corin. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Hernandez. Yes. Trustee Merrick. Yes. Mr. Love? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Madam Chair, Trustee Johnson Bureau can participate uh, remotely. Thank you so much. And if you'll join me in the pledge, please. And at this time, I'll encounter if any board member has a known or perceived conflict of interest with any item on the agenda. None. None, Corin. Seeing none. And I'll open the floor for public comment, if any. All right. Well, you'll get a second chance later on. So if you're just waiting there, marinating. Um, before we move to approval of agenda, um, as again, we have a very packed, uh, packed schedule today, Andrew, I'd like to um, have a 15 minute time limit on each of our upcoming presentations and discussion points, uh, inclusive of Q&A. So if there's a staff member who wouldn't mind timing that, I'd appreciate it just to make sure that everyone gets their chance. Yes, Madam Chair, we will time it and we will let people know. Thank let you so know. much. <clears throat> At this time, I'll entertain a motion to approve our agenda as presented. So moved, Shaldra Hernandez. Seconded, Corin. Thank you so much. <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, Councilor Corin. Yes. Commissioner Shaldra Hernandez. Yes. Trustee Merrick. Yes. Mr. Love. Yes. Madam Mayor. Yes. Trustee Johnson Burek? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Madam Chair, the agenda is approved. Thank you so much. And minutes from our March 3rd meeting were included in the packet. Hopefully, you've had a chance to look those over. And if there are no amendments, I'll call for a motion to approve the agenda, or I'm sorry, the minutes as presented. Motion to approve the minutes. Chaldra Hernandez? Thank you. Second, Trustee Merrick. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, Councillor Corin. Yes. Commissioner Shaljo Hernandez. Yes. Trustee Merrick. Yes. Mr. Love. 
Yes. Madam Mayor? Yes. Trustee Johnson Burek? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Madam Chair, the minutes are approved. Thank you so much. Okay, moving on to action items. Uh, first up, only up, 7.1, resolution 23-07, a resolution amending the uh, fiscal year 2023 to 2024 UPWP. If I can get a motion to approve, please. Move to approve, Gordon. Second, Chandra Hernandez. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is Andrew Ray on behalf of MPO staff. Um, as everyone here is aware, uh, the Unified Planning Work Program, or the UPWP, is the uh, biennial document that outlines both the fiscal and the time uh, budgets of the MPO and lists out the, the activities that will be undertaken by MPO staff uh, during the two-year time period. The current UPWP uh, is the 2023 to 2024 federal fiscal UPWP, and it went into effect on October the 1st of 2022. The amendment that we are bringing before the board today um, is a little bit different than we have in the past. Historically, uh, the DOT was only interested in the so-called federal funding categories and how MPO staff allocated its time between those. Um, however, starting with this year, uh, the, uh, the DOT is also interested in the, um, the uh, budget by line item, which if the board would care to turn to page 43 of the packet, um, it has all of the items uh, listed uh, in, in their totality. Um, specifically though, uh, we are making changes on the basis of some salary increases that the City of Las Cruces implemented for MPO staff in December of last year. Um, I'm not going to read through all of the numbers as that would take uh, some of our precious and limited time here today, but I do want to highlight the seeming oddity that's there on the screen of while all the other costs, uh, or at least the cost of personnel benefits, uh, personnel costs went up, benefits went down. That was because of elections made by members of MPO staff that actually reduced the benefits burden on uh, our, our overall budget. The other line items that are listed there are adjustments to move more money into the salary line item. This has been reviewed by the TAC and by the uh, BPAC, and both entities recommended approval, and staff request that you, rec that you approve these amendments to the UPWP at today's meeting. And that concludes my presentation, and I'll stand now for any questions. Questions for Andrew? No? Seeing none, you can call the question. Councillor Corrin? Yes. Councillor or Commissioner Shojo Hernandez? Yes. Trustee Merrick? Yes. Mr. Love? Yes. Madam Mayor? Yes. Trustee Johnson Burek? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Madam Chair, the motion passes. Thank you. Okay, moving on to our discussion items. First, 8.1 South Central Regional Transit District Transition to Electric Buses Presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like at this time to introduce Mr. David Armijo. Uh, thank you very much. At this pace, you'll have us out the door in about 15 to 20 minutes. I, <laughs> obviously, they're taking it very seriously, so I'll try to hold up my end of that. Again, I'm David Armijo, the Executive Director for the South Central Regional Transit District, and a uh, pleasure to meet you all. Some of you have not had the opportunity to, to work with. So uh, just as an overview of the presentation, I wanted to bring up these five key, well, four key points. Uh, one of the things that changed the math for us in the quest to have a zero emission transition plan to bring electric buses to town was the fact that the infrastructure law was passed back in 2021 and we were one of the first agencies in the state to receive funding. We started with a two and a half million dollar grant for three buses, charging stations, installation that we received in August. We're going to be deploying that in the coming year. We also received another $3.1 million grant for two electric buses, facility acquisition, and support of the bus fleet. Uh, and again, all this comes through it. The other thing that's really important to note is that bipartisan infrastructure grant is 90-10. So for every dollar we come up with locally, that gives us $9 of federal funds. So it's a tremendous opportunity uh, to be able to get projects done. So 
No, normally it's 80, 80, 20 and operating it's 50, 50. So this goes a long ways. I'll go over a brief timetable of events and then what the next steps are to bring these vehicles to Doniana County. So the transition plan was something that was required by the federal government as part of the infrastructure law. So every transit system in the country, there's like 2,000 transit systems needs to have a transition plan. Most do not, including us. We scrambled, we were able to get our plan in place before the deadline of June 30th of last year. And as a result of that, we qualified for those funds that we were able to bring in. Um, big part of that was to look at what the electric buses will do. And, and also we should say that typically we only have from our 5311, which is rural grant funding for the state, we're lucky if we can get anywhere from 200 to 400,000, even 500,000 dollars a year in capital funds. Usually it's for buses, it could be for facility upgrades, bus shelters and, and so on. And so to be able to go from that to $5.5 .5 million, that's a, more than a tenfold increase is extraordinary. Uh, we not only did that, but we also got another five plus million in CMAC money. Now we're not gonna program any of that money in the coming year, we're gonna wait until next year we want to get these projects off uh, off the, the dock first and, and give ourselves time to deploy these first five and a half million, but we do have more money coming down and that's going to give us uh, more electric buses. The bus you see here is a hybrid electric. Those are the first two we started. Uh, so the fleet that we're going to be working with will initially be larger 35 foot buses with up to 24 passengers. They have ramps on them, so there's no lifts. So they're less likely to have failure problems. Uh, the second generation of buses will be the mid-size buses. These buses will give us added uh, range, and that's one of the challenges that we have electric buses is the actual range. I'm sure you've heard about that with Tesla cars, more batteries. However, in order to get more range and more batteries, you spend more money. So, you know, it's kind of a balancing act for that. These vehicles uh, on the low end will give us 225 miles, and the duty cycle in a given day is 160. So it's more than enough miles to do what we need it to do. Uh, so the first few buses will go in that direction, then we'll follow with the midsize. Uh, midsize buses right now are having difficulty with range and are having difficulty with battery electric buses. Uh, in fact, uh, they did not meet Buy America and they had a waiver passed by the Department of Transportation in January, but we think that's gonna be resolved in the coming year as, as we're dealing with all the manufacturer and shortages from the pandemic get resolved. We also think that we'll have 100% fleet uh, zero emission in Sunland Park by 2025. This is the look of the first buses. It's very similar to the ones that we got that are hybrid. Uh, again, 35 footer, 24 seats, ramps in the front door and in the back door. Uh, and these will have a substantial range. If we needed them to have a bigger range, we could add batteries to it. We think that we'll be fine. This vehicle was here in January at the Pump Up America, Pump Up Las Cruces, what do they call it? Pump Up something. <laughs> Power up, power up, thank you, I was close. Uh, but it was a great event and uh, a lot of school buses out there too. So everyone's trying to get into the electric bus world. Um, the facility grant, the second one of 3.1 million uh, was an opportunity that was res reserved. About 25% of the funds uh, in the multi-million dollar category was for rural transit. And we were one of the few transit agencies. In fact, they did not get enough uh, candidates for rural money. I thought I was asking for a lot of money at 3.1 million. I could have asked for more, but you know, here we go. But we have another opportunity to put in a grant. I'm working on that now. Uh, this acquisition will provide for expanded uh, facilities to include our administrative training headquarters, the buildings that you're looking at, the maintenance building is up on the top left. Of course, it's black and white, so it's a little bit difficult. The administrative training building is on the right. This used to be a training facility for truck drivers and whatnot. So that was about 20, 25 years ago when they started this. So it's an older facility. Uh, but we believe we can get the land much cheaper than what we're seeing. I think Las Cruces' property is looking at $16 million, and they've got two of those up north, and we're looking at a fraction of that. So uh, that's something to look forward to, and it will give us options. You can see on the southern part, you see a lot of dirt. That's an area that we're actually uh, investigating another grant to produce a solar farm that will actually pump up this. Uh, one of the things that the grant, uh, the, buy, uh, the infrastructure grant allows for was uh, teaming. So we formed a team in the grant application back in June of last year, which included, uh, well, <laughs> the map you just saw was help. I got help from my, Michael over here with MPO. MPO helped me with a lot of the social aspects of the grant. You know, what are we doing with workforce development, things like that. So he helped me get a lot of the data I needed for that from the census, which was relatively new, uh, and helped with that package. So we see them as part of our technical team 
charge point, uh, which if you look at the charging station outside before you came in, if you notice that in the parking lot, that's a charge point. Uh, they're the contractor we're working on with our manufacturer, Gillig bus. And then Diamond is one of the local companies in Santa Teresa that will be doing the install for the electric. And then El Paso Electric, of course, we will be enhancing the, the line to do that. So just kind of a picture of that aspect. Um, I won't go through every part of the timeline, but uh, I think they made the, the thing available to you. This all started in September 2021 with a 10-year plan. And then, of course, you heard me say the grants. We applied for those back in June. Uh, we received the money in August, or I'd like to think we received the money. We, we received authorization. We're still going through a lot of processes of regional transportation improvement plan and all the programming, but that's going to be in place this year. We asked for additional funds in CMAC grants. We received that award. Uh, but the most important part of the chart is on the right side. So in April, we began uh, with the stations being ordered and with delivery in a few months, working with the team, working with the electric company. We should have that in place uh, by September. The buses are on order uh, for the second quarter, April 2024. And so we're trying to actually close that a little bit closer. Uh, it's a little bit of chicken and egg because everyone's saying, well, you, you really don't want you to have buses to have charging stations can't get charging stations without the buses and so on and so forth. So uh, we're working our way diligently. So these first three buses will be uh, the test case for us. Charging stations, very similar to the one, this is the picture on the right is the one that's outside uh, and that's handled by Char charge point. There's a number of companies around the country doing that. Um, this one I'd like to show, uh, this is from a photo from a Chinese city, uh, apparently the largest solar powered uh, ins uh, installation in the country. Ours would not be anywhere near this large, but it is, it is our plan uh, to be able to have a charging station in place that would pick up not only fueling for the vehicles, but for the facility itself. Uh, we also are looking to work with the electric company so that we would actually tag into their system so there could be periods of time where we're actually generating excess capacity that would be available to ratepayers, and so we would get a little bit of money back on that. Um, and then the last part, I mentioned the solar farm. So we think that this is something that will help us. Uh, I did a little research and called some of my contacts in Los Angeles. I was the first one to do two facilities of this type uh, over two decades ago, and they now have put solar power in virtually every one of their facilities. And so you have to start somewhere, even though 20 years ago, as I was told, we were pretty much on the well, bleeding edge and a lot of that equipment has been replaced, but we got started and, uh, and that's kind of what we're doing. We're sharing this information with uh, the folks here at Roadrunner and even Sun Metro in El Paso. And we think this regional area and that partnership needs to come together for training of staff, recruitment of, in, of our mechanics, our drivers, and everything we learn from that we share with one another because I think in the end, we're on the front end. Uh, there is work going on in the north. It's going a little slower. Uh, Roadrunner already has our vehicles lined up and they're working on their facility now. So we're a little bit behind them on this process, but it's really not about who comes in first. It's really what we're all trying to do. And our goal is to get those 10 buses uh, ordered in the next three years, and then we'll follow that uh, with another 10 buses uh, probably six, seven years down the road after, as the other buses start to retire. So it's gonna take us a while. I'm estimating close to 10 years, but you know, 10 years will go pretty fast. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Is there anything else I can answer for you? Uh, I'll just share this photo because this is where we got our award last month. Uh, we got Agency of the Year by the state of New Mexico. On the left, that's Ricky Serna, our Transportation Secretary. Those of you who might know Ricky, uh, Mr. Serna. And then, of course, Dave Harris has been uh, involved with our project since the beginning. Any questions? Oh, thank you so much. Questions for Mr. Armijo? No? All right, well, thank you so much. Thank really you. appreciate it. Great stuff coming. Sure. Okay, discussion item 8.2, proposed prioritization of the Transportation Project Fund project applications. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the Policy Board. Uh, so uh, one quick slide just to kind of go over the Transportation Project Fund. Uh, we did receive three projects, so you'll be received three presentations today. Uh, in order, it'll be, and these are just the order we received the projects in, City of Las Cruces, Town of Mesilla, and then Doniana County. Uh, and then, of course, uh, each project will have uh, 15 minutes for presentation and questions. Uh, so first will be the City of Las Cruces, and Mr. Mark Miller will be presenting it for them.
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Mark Miller, City of, Las, City of Las Cruces. I'm the Senior Long Range Planner with the uh, Comprehensive and Strategic Planning Program. Um, uh, this project is a, is a project that's a collaboration between Public Works um, and, and my program with support um, from Stantec, who uh, did the initial scoping, cost estimates, um, and lending some additional support. I believe we have a representative from Stantec actually um, here in the audience uh, somewhere uh, for questions. Um, so this project uh, is a reconstruction um, proposal to include uh, pedestrian, uh, bicycle, transit improvements throughout the roadways. Uh, we're looking at El Paseo, a small bit of Alameda, um, Idaho, as well as South Walnut. can see my cursor here. Uh, you can see up here we have this small bit of Alameda from West Amador down to South Main. Uh, South Main uh, all the way to University for El Paseo. Um, and then South Main um, all the way over to where we transition to Walnut for East Idaho. And then Walnut up to Loman. Um, this, this project is uh, obviously including a major north-south connector as well as east-west with some special focus in on this intersection of Idaho and El Paseo. Uh, this table provides the uh, phasing and cost estimates uh, provided by um, Stantec. You'll see that the, the full project um, proposed cost is 3.8 million, a little over 3.8 million. Um, this gets us from study to public involvement um, and then all the way to preliminary and final roadway design plans. To give you just a, a broad overview of just the existing conditions um, of these two corridors currently, um, there are a few high crash intersections um, on both these roadways, which, which I'll go over. Um, there's intermittent bike facilities, but not really a, a well-connected bike network um, connected to these two corridors. Um, there's a significant sidewalk gap um, on El Paseo Road. The, the sidewalks, although it's five foot kind of across the board on both roadways. They don't quite meet that NACTO standard of six foot minimum. Um, and there's, there's various adopted plans from the city of Las Cruces that kind of need implementation on both of these corridors. Um, so we put together a couple of just typical cross sections. Um, keep in mind, these were put together from aerials. So there's, there's quite a margin of error. Uh, that 12 foot could be 12.5, it could be 11, 11, five. There's, there's quite a bit of margin of error, but this is just to give you a basic idea of, of what we're looking at here. Um, so starting at, at South Walnut, you'll see that we actually do have some bike lanes, which are actually green, by the way, which we'll get to um, later in the presentation. Um, two, two travel lane, 12 foot. We come down to East Idaho. Um, it starts out about 18, 16 to 18 foot travel lanes, um, but then constrains down to 12. There's there's quite a constrained right-of-way transition there um, on Idaho. We go further. Um, it's not on the cross-section, but there's a good space in here where there aren't any bike lanes. But then eventually, we transition again to having bike lanes um, when we get a little bit west of uh, uh, South Solano. Um, I think the key point on, on this, this corridor, um, is that throughout, you have uh, quite a bit of variability. Um, in pavement condition and right-of-way width, uh, the adjacent land use and character of the areas along these corridors, um, the functional classification shifts. Um, so that's kind of an advantage of identifying the entirety of this corridor for the project is that we can look at the, the whole corridor holistically as opposed to more piecemeal. Um, moving on to uh, South Alameda, I think many of you are, are probably aware um, that there, there was a reconfiguration on Alameda, but this specific section does not actually have bike lanes currently. Um, and as we move down to El Paseo, um, again, there is no bike facilities along this roadway. Um, it's uh, primarily travel lanes. Um, a portion of it has a, a turn lane, but then as you go further south towards the university, it actually goes down to just a four lane with, with no uh, uh, turn lane there in the middle. Um, in terms of um, uh, uh, high crash intersections, 
Um, if we look at these two corridors, we see um, there's, there's two within the top 10, five altogether within the top 20, um, identified in the MPO uh, annual safety report, I believe. Um, so, so what is kind of the vision for these two roadways? Um, we look at our, our adopted uh, city plans. So first off, Elevate Las Cruces, the comprehensive plan for the city. Um, it delineates between urban, suburban, and rural streets. Um, and, and these are urban streets. So as opposed to just accommodating bicycle, um, pedestrian um, users, uh, we're, we're trying to encourage um, those, that, that multimodal transportation. Um, we are looking to increase that on those roads and really activate the roadsides and get that transportation land use connection and interface. Um, from the El Paseo Corridor Community Blueprint, it specifically talks about redeveloping that road to be, to be safer, um, more equitable to these different users and really allow better access to the adjacent uses um, along the entirety of that, that roadway. Um, from the active transportation plan, uh, the active transportation plan uh, identifies pedestrian focus areas, which tells us um, wh where we recommend to, to focus our investments in. Um, and uh, the, the blue on this map here is all the pedestrian focus areas. Suffice to say, both of these corridors, the majority of it is within these areas. Um, if we move to the active transportation plan um, proposed bikeway network, this actually uh, provides specific recommendations for different roadways. So we can see uh, here on Idaho uh, a recommendation for separated bike lanes, um, which is, is to say actually separated from the roadway, um, a transition into buffered bike lanes, uh, which would be your typical bike lane with a two, three foot buffer between travel lane and bike lane. Um, as we kind of transition up and travel to the east, uh, as we're getting up to Walnut, we see a shared lane or a bike boulevard um, in that smaller right of way. And then um, where Walnut is coming towards Loman, again, we see buffered bike lanes. Um, if we look at uh, Alameda, um, there is a recommendation for bike lanes on that small portion that's included in this project. Um, but I think this is a really important point is that the entirety of El Paseo all the way down to university, the active transportation plan says just further study needed. Well, we don't have recommendations in that plan because it was cognizant that we need a closer look at this corridor. And so that's a big hope of the TPF is that we can really use this study to do that. Um, whenever we're doing any sort of new projects, uh, we always try to look at, at recent projects to try and leverage work that we've done uh, recently. So we did want to highlight um, a couple of recent projects, specifically in the Walnut um, uh, area leading up uh, towards Loman over by uh, Lynn Middle School, uh, Young Park. Um, early 2021, uh, the planning program, uh, uh, then being led by uh, Shrijana Bosnat, uh, initiated the, the city's first uh, pop-up bike lanes project. Um, I was the project manager the majority of that, we partnered with the Sustainability Office and Public Works um, to put temporary improvements um, along Walnut um, and Nevada. This consisted of uh, green bike lanes, uh, temporary separation, as well as extending existing bike lanes uh, with temporary paints. Now you can see this project extent here. So all of this area is within the bounds of the TPF um, uh, application. So, um, you know, why did we do a pop-up here? And really just why do a pop-up in general? Um, pop-up projects like this can be demonstration projects to show some road configuration that maybe we're not used to. Um, or it can be a pilot project um, where you can actually have, as your public engagement, users of the roadway um, use this temporary installation and then provide their feedback to adjust that temporary um, uh, project or feed into a more permanent project. So it's an iterative design process. Um, the majority of this project actually did become uh, permanent, by the way. Um, and obviously why here specifically, uh, again, Lynn Middle School, Young Park, a transit connection, and a, a whole slew of planning recommendations that, that need implementation. 
um, feedback was was really good from the public as well, which led to that that permanent uh, piece of it. Um, so here you just see like a, a, we had a, a cool community bike ride with Safe Rest the School coordinator Ashley Curry, uh, George Pearson. Um, you can see here just what this actually looked like at the time with these temporary paints. Um, following that, actually one year and one day exactly, um, we then had cool green paint uh, go, in, go in as a permanent installation. Um, this was a project that the S Sustainability Office initiated, again, partnering with, with us, the planning program, as well as Public Works. Um, and that cool green paint is intended to, to mitigate uh, urban heat um, and also prolong the life of the pavement itself. Um, so the, the pop-up kind of informed this, um, and, then, and then this was done, uh, obviously, in 2022. Um, so the reason why um, I wanted to bring this up was just to show that um, th these activities can actually inform this portion of, of this broader project. So moving up to these broader corridors is just taking it yet another, another step forward. And you can see this is the, uh, those final green bike lanes down on, uh, on Nevada. Um, I hope I'm within my time limit, but uh, that's, that's all I have for you. I, I stand for your questions. Questions? I just sort of have comments or, or sort of just to give perspective to me and helping to think about this. I think we've been having a conversation about uh, El Paseo in particular related to uh, the metro metropolitan redevelopment area and, and establishing that. But I think we've had long conversations about how to fix this area for pedestrian fatalities. There are a lot of uh, p pedestrian dangers and risks. I think there are a lot of folks who are on marginalized folks who are centered in these parts of town. And so I think it's really critical that we think about the infrastructure. Um, and some, I, I wish George isn't here, which I feel like George, well, I usually refer to George in the audience and he's not here, but, but you know, um, Mr. Pearson pointed out that we should prioritize places like this in our in our thinking and planning. And, and there are a number of federal grants that really have a high standard for shovel readiness. And I feel like I really appreciate you bringing this forward to get this project closer to shovel ready because it's really hard to do the planning on a number of other types of grants that we that we would like to go after. So, um, and it fits in with a lot of our city goals. So thank you for, for sharing and just to sort of affirm that this falls in line with, I think, something George would be happy about. That's why I'm so disappointed that he's not here. Uh, George, if you're listening, um, see you later. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Coran. Yes, please, Mayor. Madam <laughs> Vice Chair. Um, so the $3.8 um, is all just for planning and design. This is no construction? Uh, that is correct, uh, Mayor. Okay. That is really quite expensive, I guess. Being from a small town, I can't believe $3 million is just for planning and design. But uh, I'm concerned with the area from Solano, maybe up to Lees, that that road is really narrow. How do you anticipate, anticipate putting in a bike uh, lane there and a walk? I, I understand the sidewalk because there is a sidewalk there, but a bike lane I think would be very difficult uh, to put in there just being because the road is so narrow. Um, Madam Chair, Mayor, um, so these, these preliminary recommendations from the Active Transportation Plan, um, they're a little bit more broad level and in this plan of design, that's when we can get into the details of does that particular bike facility, uh, is, is it gonna fit within the right of way um, or do we need to amend these initial planning recommendations? Um, so absolutely, if there are sections that need to be a different sort of configuration, that's what we would want to get into. Okay, thank you. And then the other is, uh, you showed the report that showed the different accidents that have happened, uh, and I'm more focused on the Al Paseo, Idaho, maybe from Maine to um, Solano, I mean to, uh, well, maybe to Solano. Would you happen to know how many of these accidents would be more classified into the homeless uh, population that's there versus um, um, vehicle accidents? Um, Madam Chair, Mayor, uh, we, we pulled that data actually from the MPO annual safety reports. I don't believe that there's a breakdown by demographics. However, um, MPO staff, if, if that's correct or not. 
Madam Chair, we do not have the, that level of demographic breakdown in the crash reports. And Madam Chair, we are at our 15 minute limit. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. And I think uh, Town of Messia is up next. Yes, Madam Chair, Town of Messia is next, and Mr. Rod McGillivray will be presenting that. Madam uh, Chair, Policy Board members, Rod McGilvery with the Town of Messia, thank you for allowing us to do this presentation today. Um, so, small project, huge emphasis on safety, um, low cost project. Basically, we have taking, taken the uh, Calle del Norte Trail all the way to the Messia Lateral. And we were not able to get past the Messia lateral because we didn't have enough funds. Um, we had a similar design in our original plans that was put into the plans as an ad alternate, but we didn't have the funding. So basic purpose of this project is to take the um, north side of the Messia lateral apart, slide it back, put it back together. Um, leaving enough room for a um, curb and gutter and asphalt section to get past that, to take the trail past the uh, Messia lateral. This is a map of the area. You can see the uh, Messia lateral <clears throat> right in the middle. The bottom of the page you'll see the uh, is Avenida de Messia. Um, this is on NM359, also known as Calle del Norte. You can see where the trail comes from the top of the map and ends um, basically right there at the at the Messia lateral. Phase one of the Calle del Norte fail um, went from the river levee um, to Paisano and phase two filled in from Paisano to the Messia lateral and then also from the La Llorona trail at the, um, where the city ended at the river and we tied that back into the um, river at the river levee at the Calle del Norte Trail. So th this will be a continuation all the way from the La Llorona Trail to the Mesilla Lateral. Um, so the project can, provides a continuation of the Calle del Norte Phase Two. Um, as I stated, it's modifications to the existing drainage structure. Um, current, currently, users um, have to are are forced, especially if they're walking in groups, they're forced off, forced into the road, the highway. Um, so it's a huge safety project. Um, in my eyes, it's it's a detrimental detrimental safety project. Project is shovel ready because, as I stated, we had previously put a similar uh, design in as an ad alt into the uh, Calle del Norte Phase Two which means we've already gotten clearances, including SHPO. Um, depending on the timeline for funding, they may have to be redone. We under, we will probably uh, at least resubmit them, but we would anticipate no pushback. So the project can be completed within 12 months, and it's a very small uh, monetary project, 163,262. Um, <clears throat> It's a cross section of the of the uh, um, of the detail, so you can see at the the upper uh, left or upper right where basically all the work happens on the north, where we just take it apart and, and uh, reconstruct that um, lateral head wall and uh, inverted siphon. Um, that's just our cost estimate. Uh, we do have um, more money in uh, uh, a pretty decent contingency in there. 128, no, I mean 28,000, I'm sorry. And then we do have uh, funds for engineering and, and GRTs, tax and everything. So we're, we're very comfortable with our, our estimate. That's a picture from across the street of the lateral. You can see the narrowness of it. Um, you can see it's pretty narrow. It's less than five feet, 
currently it, it, it's just short of five feet from the edge of pavement. So to put a um, even a sidewalk in there right now is um, as the only other alternative. The sidewalk would be uh, like three and a half feet or something like that. Um, we had all we had three out of the four uh, MPO prioritization criteria for project planning. Um, this is identified on uh, local and regional planning documents. Um, we're ready and begin spending within three months, and we definitely could be uh, complete within 12 months. And then this is a continuation of a previously funded TPF phase. Um, I think the MPO needs to add to their criteria of safety. Um, great presentation from the city. Huge, huge uh, proponent of safety. We just, all the projects that would fall under safety are critical in my opinion. And I'll stand for questions. Questions? Madam Chair. Yes. I just have one question and I was reading through the packet. Um, and EBID did send out a response um, since it is an EBID culvert, correct? Um, can you just explain what the change in crossing structure, they said that it was a special agreement that was being allowed? Um, what does that mean exactly? Is So every, um, every place that, um, like the agreement, and um, Mr. Love might be able to jump in and help on this because it's actually the, state's agreement with EBID to to have that crossing. Um, I believe that the state owns it. And so it's a permitted crossing already. So all we have to get from EBID is a work permit, permit to do the work. On this last phase, I was able to put up some gates for EBID to, um, um, so we did get a permit for them. The purpose of that letter was a, um, a letter of support showing that, um, that that we can do the project, basically, because we are already permitted to cross, to cross the road or to cross the lateral. Chicken, who was there first, I guess, the lateral. <laughs> Other questions? All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you. And Madam Chair, up next will be Doniana County and Mr. Mo Mobed uh, for the county. I guess it's good afternoon, Madam Chair. My name is Mo Mobed. I'm the county engineer for Doniana County. Actually, last Tuesday was my first anniversary with the Doniana County, so mm -hmm. I passed that one. I've been married 45 years. I think uh, it was easier than that one year, but, you know. So, no, it's been a pleasure working for Doniana County, and it's really appreciated to be presenting to you uh, a project we call Desert Windway Construction Project. This project is a cost of it. I know Madam Mayor is going to pay attention to that one. It's thirteen million three hundred and eighty-nine thousand dollars, and and the pro the project is a really was a priority in 2015 when it was first uh, developed through the Mesilla Valley MPO and significantly improves the connectivity of the northeast portion of the city as going, as you know, how fast it's going to I-25, which is almost the exit nine or Doniana exit. And also this road connects to the Oregon Mountain Desert Peak National Monument. The Desert Wind Project is a uh, key connector between the county and the city. And as I said earlier, also was in the 2040, the vision 
called One Vision, One Valley was the strategic plan with the city of Las Cruces was the lead on it. And this project was listed as one of the top priority. And it connects I-25 Torp Road interchange going west to the, going east, I'm sorry, to the Red Hawk Gulf Road and on the east side. And the length of this project is 3.7 miles. On the east end, the Desert Wind project, as you see, will make an improvement to the city of Las Cruces at Arroyo Road and also the Red, Red Hawk Golf Road. And construction ends at the county limits, which starts city limits. So it connects the city and the county. This project improves the movement of people and goods in the community and creates alternative east-west route from I-25 to the north part of the Las Cruces. This is a picture of the existing area that this, this portion of the road is, uh, is all, the dirt area is all located in a BLM property, which is about 1.3 miles of it, and connects also to Oregon Mountain Desert Peak National Monument. So this creates for people who want to do hiking and biking to that area, and also access to the trailhead, which is, there'll be no future property uh, development private property in the National Monument area. And those pictures show you the dirt area and also the National, the Desert Peak. And also on the bottom right hand picture is the end of the development happening in the city of Las Cruces that connects to our project. We, we, Las Cruces Public Schools have really supported this project and showing a lot of interest in it because they are improving the access to their school. They have a preschool and also the three other schools and the project aligns the timing of the students and also with a new school being opened in 2025. So uh, again, as we discussed earlier, 2045 active mobility plan that was Mesillo Valley MPO that this was in the future channel for the future bike lanes and uh, trails and provide comp good access and shoulder to the, through the BLM property to the National Monument. There's another picture of that from the aerial photo showing the segment of it and we kind of looking at it as a three segments road, the west area, which starts from Thorpe Road, goes to the La Reina Road. This one bisects the Calle Los Lomas Road and ties into La Reina, and we improving the intersection and also continues east on a desert windway. And at the end of the desert windway, where they starts the BLM property and then connects to the city. This is some of the pictures of the, at the left hand side, you see the connection to the Thorpe area. This is right in front of the, the Ben Archer Health Center. This creates, we shifting the project away from the Ben Archer, so it would be a lot safer for the people coming to Ben Archer and also moves the traffic away from Ben Archer's parking area. So this creates a better access to Ben Archer and also safer connection to Ben Archer. And also we have, a, like I said earlier, Doniana Mutual has the water tanks. We are bypassing the water tank. We're going north of the water tank and also creates better access for their tanks in case they need to go work on it. And we have a Job concrete plant, which is very active. And uh, they, we met with Job, and they have a lot of plans to do a lot of expansion. 
So uh, they're going to create a lot more traffic. So this project is really going to help the safety of the movement of traffic in that road. Again, this, the central portion of that project is in the most, all of it is in the residential area. And that's why we only using the 50 foot existing right away. So we are not acquiring any right away. And we are not dislocating or impacting any properties. And the only right away, like I said earlier, we buying is on the east segment, which is in a BLM and also on the west segment. This is a typical section of the roadway we are proposing. Is there two 12 foot lanes and eight foot shoulder on each side? And we are designing it for a 30 mile an hour because we are classifying it as a minor collector road for this project. And also, this was one of the best alternatives we came up with because we actually studied nine alternatives. Mesillo Valley MPO suggested the route to be built a long time ago, but we had to go through the alternative studies and we had nine alternatives. And this is the best one based on really the right of way impact, the cost and mobility and safety. So that's why this road was picked. This is the part of the right of way that we were talking about if you would have done any widening. But on the west segment, you will see it going north of the water tanks. And we are taking some property over there. And we figured for the whole project, we need about 10 acres of property at $80,000 an acre. So about $800,000 for the whole right away. And on the residential, as you can see the bottom left fan picture, we, are, we would have impacted a lot of properties if we would have done, get a lot of right away. So we stick, we stay with a 80 foot right away as we have. This is an estimate of the cost. I know the cost is, seems a lot higher than what it should have been, but this was, we had the original estimate was about $8 million. But as Mr. Love from NMDOT can tell you last two years, our construction has gone up 50%. So that's why you will see the $13.4 million tag on it. And the county is offering to match it by 5%, which we're going to the commissioner's court actually this month to ask for the commitment to provide the 5% match. Again, this is another area of the showing the project. It starts from Thorpe all the way to the east side to connect to the city. And the, the, our plan is the county has the budget for it, and we already have all the budget to do the design and also do the environmental study. So design is almost, I would say by April, well, we are, we are in April. so. We are 60% completed design, but by June or July, we will have 100% completed design. And when the complete design start, completes, then we allow our, to do the survey and uh, see how much right away exactly we need. And that one will take us from August to July of next year to do the survey and acquire the right away. And then by that time, we are ready for construction, which is would be July of 24. And that's presentation. Any questions? Questions? From and Trustee uh, Johnson Burek, I apologize. I keep forgetting that you're here with us. And I intended to ask you if you had questions, but 
Do you have any questions? <laughs> Thank you, Counselor. I don't have any questions. Thank you. Okay, great. Please feel free to, free to shout in if I forget you. All right. All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the Policy Board. So uh, what staff is requesting today is a preliminary ranking of the projects. Uh, we need that for the resolution. Of course, that is, uh, can be changed uh, at the next meeting. Uh, when you uh, go to vote on it. Um, and we do need a ranking. Uh, we can't be rank everything number one, and it can't be we're not ranking any of them. MDOT has required a ranking. They said they will not look at any projects uh, if they are like all ranked number one or no rankings. Okay, so I haven't been through one of these before, so how, how does this roll? Uh, Madam Chair, you and the other members of the board are going to have to talk amongst yourselves here before us and figure out what your intentions are going to be. Best of luck. I will say, Madam Chair, though, um, following up on what Mr. Loya said, when the board considers this next month for action, this is going to go before the BPAC, this is going to go before the TAC, so you will have the advice of the advisory committees as far as what their rankings for the projects will be so you won't be so the board will not be completely uh, out on its own um, but staff is not going to be providing any input or editorializing of uh, these projects our role is uh, strictly curative we're here to ensure that the applications are complete and ready to be submitted to the state when this is all done um, but the board is ultimately the entity that is going to have to decide uh, on the rankings. And, and I know this is hard. This is comparing an apple to an orange to a cherry. But such is the ruling of NMDOT. And if we want to participate in the process, this is what we'll have to do. Okay. So, so just to clarify what we come up with today, we are not beholden to in the future. And we will be having some input from our TAC and BPAC Committees. Yes, Madam Chair, that's exactly right. Um, we we need to do this in order to have open meetings compliance, to have sure. a written resolution for the public to review prior to the next meeting. But the policy board is at complete liberty to do a tentative ranking today and then rank them in completely the reverse order in, in May. So May, May is the one where the decision will be final. Today is just preliminary in order to enable us to be compliant with Open Meetings Act. All right. Well, whenever we do this kind of budget stuff at the city, I always sort of jokingly refer to it as the Hunger Games. So fellow board members, may the odds be ever in your favor. And uh, let's get this party started. Can I ask? Oh, sorry. Can I just ask a question? Please. Just uh, in terms of establishing our values in this conversation and or giving us the proper context. Um, I, I know there are a million variables and we could debate those all day and I think we should, but I, I actually think we could come to consensus around values. But I am curious uh, in you all's experience if, uh, like, what are the odds that all three of these get funded versus not? And does the amount of the ask impact the likelihood of its fulfillment? I guess. Madam Chair, <laughs> Councilor Corrin, um, I don't know. And I know that that's probably the last thing that you wanted to hear me say. But um, the, uh, the, the Transportation Commission ultimately is the one who puts the seal of approval on who gets the money. Um, so in past years, um, I'm, try, I'm trying to go through my head. I know last year not all of the projects from this MPO were funded. Uh, some of them were. Some of them were not. Um, I, I don't recall, uh, and maybe Mr. Loy can help me, I don't recall if we've ever had a situation where all the projects from this MPO have been funded. Not in the last three years. Usually um, if a jurisdiction is asked for multiple projects, only one will get picked things like that, uh, all three do fall within, I did a review of the projects, the past projects that were accepted, all of them fall within the, the uh, amount of money. Uh, so they will, the, in, uh, if the past shows us anything, 
uh, the, the transportation board will approve big projects as well as small projects. So it does depend on basically their mood. Thank you. I, I just have one. I'm just going to take a stab at a value that I, I would argue we should put our thoughts behind. I would lean toward intensely multimodal things, valuing pedestrian and cyclist health and safety as one of our priorities, because I feel like as a city, that's one of the things that I think we we elevate, even though that's actually in contrast with probably what the people in my district would want in this particular situation. So I just speak to that as my value coming in. Yeah. Madam Chair. Yes. Um, with that being said, and I, I definitely would echo that, I think that public safety is huge. Having those bike lanes would be amazing. Um, and I think there's something to be asked if there was any capital outlay that was given to this project, was this an ask? Do you know if this was an ask for capital outlay at all from the, the Desert state? Wind one? No, Desert Windway was, oh, okay. but this El Paseo Idaho project. It's a number of them. I think are on our capital out on our CIP. I sort of am looking at that. To see. Okay, but, but I think I think a number of segments there are on our CIP. But I don't know the the entire project. I don't think appears as its own thing. I think okay. that's my. So I think with that being said as well, and I think that's something that we should probably look at as a board, is to see the feasibility of um, where the rest of the money is going to come from to fund certain projects. And maybe this is a question for staff. Um, they can choose to fund it fully or they can choose to fund it partially. How does that usually look in the grand scheme? Uh, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Shojo Hernandez, yes, they, they, I have seen them do multiple divvying up of the funds in for, for current and then for also, it, it goes as much as two years in advance. Is that correct, Mr. Loya? That is correct. Yeah, so two, two years that they'll be willing to, to kind of, I guess, phase it, for lack of a better word, although that's not proper terminology. But, but yeah, they, they are willing to kind of divvy it up in that manner. He's at the podium like he has an answer to my question, Ooh, I like and I appreciate that. Hi, um, Madam Chair, regarding uh, Idaho and El Paseo beyond capital outlay, 90% um, sure no, that was not um, asked on that, but I'm confirming just to make sure with our, our CIP analyst right now. Thank you. Thank you. No, this is so weird. Oh, it's not weird. It's not weird at all. Um, so with that being said, I'm just going to throw it out there that I, I I think we should, in compliance with the Open Meetings Act, probably go down the line and see where we're all at, possibly, as far as it goes with the three projects. Um, it looks like the Messia project is the least expensive, which is probably the easiest to fund right away. Um, and then you have the two, well, you have the really big boy, which is Desert Windway, and then you have the city's project for um, planning of those pedestrian bike paths. Um, so I think maybe, Chair, maybe we just go down the, the thing and see if we can come up with a consensus for a number one, and then maybe just take it from there. Yeah, I love that idea. Let's we'll try it. Which way do we want to start the line? Oh, that way. <laughs> oh, down. Yeah, all the way down with the mayor. <laughs> um, Madam Chair, don't forget about Trustee Johnson Bureau. Absolutely. Oh, start with her. Will not. Yeah, would you like to be first, oh, oh, Trustee yeah, Johnson Bureau? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I actually, um, based on the criteria that was brought up, uh, um, the fact that um, Councillor Corrin suggested the your pedestrian safety, biking, all of that, and after listening and watching all the presentations, and based on the financial aspect of it, I would actually rank, because of also it being shovel-ready, um, the town of Mesilla. Um, that's just my own thoughts, and I, I was thinking of all the people from 
throughout the county and the city and the town that use that bike path. So those are just in processing everything, my initial thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor? Uh, and I too agree uh, with what uh, Commissioner Hernandez just said and what um, Trustee Johnson Bureau just said is, um, it is shovel ready. We do have the funds set aside for the match and uh, it's the least expensive of the million next compared to the million dollar projects. And uh, it is in collaboration um, with the Department of Transportation also uh, because it is a, Calle del Norte is a DOT road, uh, but it also uh, as trustee Johnson Burek mentioned is the pathway also to the river to connect to La Llorona Park, to the Bosque Park. I, it, it's a collaboration of many entities um, servicing the bike, uh, bicyclists, uh, walkers. Um, it's just a range of uh, possibilities that are going on over there. And so I would support the town of Mesilla as project as number one. Okay, thank you. Mr. Lowe? Um, Town of Mesilla project is number one based on everything that the mayor just said. Short and to the point. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Trustee Merrick. Um, I would also go with the Town of Mesilla. This is a project we've been working on for a long time and we're eager to finish it. Okay, great. Commissioner Shaljo Hernandez. It's a really hard place to be in. <laughs> <laughs> Someone was supposed to mix it up down the way so we could. <laughs> um, so I know that Desert Wind Way has been on our radar for a very long time. It's a connector. Um, it would open up the possibility of subdivisions and alleviating some of that, you know, Highway 70 traffic that we all hate whenever we have to go up there. Um, so that's my plug for that. But at the end of the day, knowing that there is a low cost factor to the project in Mesilla, um, hoping that we could list a number two that would be, well, of course it's gonna be one of the other two, but um, listing Mesilla as number one, knowing that there's a very small price on that, I almost feel compelled to also say that that might be something that we definitely wanna put forward because the chance of that getting fully funded and completed is there. So I guess I would kind of say Messia first. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of where I'm at with just the price is so low that I would hope that they would go to number two and look at that as well because if we put Messia at number three, they won't even look at it. But if it's a number one, it's, it's a drop in the hat when you look at the other two. So that's where I'm at right now. Okay, thank you. Um, and again, not being familiar with how this kind of funding shakes out typically, I don't know if that is, if that's a good strategy to employ. I mean, and no one in this room can answer that question. We can only go on past, uh, on past uh, experience. Um, I see the, I see what you're saying um, and I agree. I, now, let me ask this as well. The prioritization, so when we submit, they will see the entire ranking system, the one, two, and three. Yes, Madam Chair, they will see all, and just for, I guess, administrative purposes, also say District 1, after we submit, will also give their ranking, um, but then it's uh, DOT up in Santa Fe and the Transportation Commission that also that ultimately make the decision. So there's actually going to be several different prioritizations that this is going to receive before okay. the final arbiters get a look at it. Okay, great. And that was but my they question. will they will get everything. They will get okay. everything. Okay, and that's my question. Do they provide for us um, a rubric or a scoring system? How much does our prioritization really matter? in the end. Uh, Madam Chair, it matters enough that they mandated that we do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, as, as part of bureaucracy, I'm raising one eyebrow right now. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you for that. So agreeing, 
not knowing how this is really going to work. I see the point of, you know, of making the Messiah project the number one priority um, because it's, it's delicious, low hanging fruit and it has a great purpose and nutritional value too, if we're going to stick with the fruit analogy. Um, so if what we're really looking at here is project number two, which I, you know, you're making your case for Desert Wind Way, so I will of course make my case for <gasps> City of Las Cruces project. Um, <laughs> I, I'll echo Councillor Coran's uh, comment on values, on valuing public safety, public safety for everyone, whether there are unhoused neighbors or uh, sheltered pedestrians, cyclists, uh, vehicle drivers, um, everybody matters. And I am so intimately familiar with the places that we're talking about, although I will say I've ridden my bike through all of these sections, including unpaved desert wind way area, so I'm, I can picture it all in my head. Um, I, I hate putting things down to just a quantifiable uh, quantifiable uh, kind of axis, but for our, how many people will we benefit for our 3.83 million for the city of Las Cruces project? Um, and again, I'm not trying to, I think that's how consistently the smaller municipalities end up overlooked. So I don't want to, I don't want to make that the sole standard, but I do think that is something that can be considered. Um, so yes, if if this is going to work how we think it's going to work, and they're like, sure, okay, cool, one hundred sixty three thousand, you guys, like that's that's great, we'll do it. And then the other numbers are going to get looked at. I'm okay with Messia at the top and City of Las Cruces number two. Councillor Coran, I, I would agree. I I just have a worry that they'll be like, oh, we can just get away with giving Southern New Mexico a tiny pittance and call it a day. Um, so I'm here for Messia being number one as well for the same reasons. <clears throat> but I would be, I kind of don't want to let the process off the hook for a bigger ticket coming down south either. Um, I would say that in prioritizing values, the folks in my district would absolutely say that I should say Desert Wind because that is my district and they do experience congestion. But I have to stick with my, my orientation toward sort of thinking about pedestrians and cyclists. So I would say Messia number one and Las Cruces number two for me too. So. Madam Chair. Yes. Um, and with that being said too, if, if that's um, Councilor Coran's concern about low hanging fruit, uh, since we're gonna do the fruit analogy, um, then maybe we should look at doing um, a different number one. I know this really screws everything up, but if that is a concern, I would never want to get overlooked for bigger projects because I can totally see that too. It's one of those things. How much money do we ha does has been allocated this year for these projects statewide? We don't know. Uh, they did not uh, actually relay that information. Of course. Uh, <laughs> So I know in years past, mm -hmm. it's been upwards of $40 million. So it does depend on the year and what uh, the legislature approves. Madam Chair, Mr. Love might actually be able to, I hate to put him on the spot, but he's the only one here who might know. It's, it's our understanding that there's supposed to be reoccurring $40 million every year. And then if the legislature wants to, they, wants to, they can add additional money to that. What we don't know is what additional has been added to it. Forty million for the state every year, reoccurring. Shouldn't we have the number for what's been added from the legislature? Isn't that the number said should, and done? The number's out there somewhere. Just somebody's keeping it. A well, secret. I'll Google. <laughs> we'll Google right now. <laughs> well, well. Well, Commissioner Sheldro Hernandez is Googling. Um, do we, can we see if we agree, if, if Messiah stays as one, where, are, where is everyone on 
two, and three. So, uh, Trustee Johnson Burek, what are your thoughts there? I I would think, based on again the values that Councillor Corn mentioned, uh, pedestrian safety, bicyclist safety. Um, I would go with the city for number two, and I absolutely um, agree with uh, Commissioner Shaljo Hernandez about trying to alleviate the traffic on Highway 70, and I see that, um, but I think based on where we're at, uh, um, that I would would again put the city second and Desert Wind third. And I, I'd also like to mention that we're also going to be getting some feedback at the next meeting from the BPAC and, and TAC as to what their thoughts are and their recommendations. So again, we're just just getting preliminary today and kind of seeing where we're all at. And then the next meeting, we'll get the feedback from the, the committees. So um, that's all I have at, at this point. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And thank you for that reminder, because I have sweaty palms and I'm getting kind of tachycardic here. So I appreciate that reminder. Um, Mayor, thoughts on two, three? No. Uh, I agree with what Trustee Johnson Bjork uh, just said. Um, I, I would rank the city of Las Cruces number two, uh, just because I see a larger, a larger population um, taking advantage of that, using it safety reasons based on the crash reports. Also, uh, I definitely would rank the city of Las Cruces number two with the county number three. Thank you so much, Mr. Lepp. Um, one of the criteria that the DOT used when ranking projects is uh, system connectivity, and the Desert Wind Way connects to uh, Thorpe Road, which is New Mexico 320, and it also falls in line with the uh, uh, project we're currently doing a study with uh, six lane and I-25, and also the work we want to do on Thorpe Road. And so with that, I'll, uh, my second choice would be Desert Wind Way. Thank you. Trustee Merrick? Um, I know Desert One Way has the support of the public school system, correct? Um, and with that being said, and them building a school here soon, and our city growing at the rapid rate it is, although I feel public safety and the safety of bicyclists is, and everyone who travels by foot and every other means of transportation is very important, um, I do believe that I would rank the county second and the city third. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Shalja Hernandez, Google update and ranking. Google update. <laughs> it's a broken link. <laughs> oh. um, that feels oddly fitting. Yes. Let's take a moment to rag on the state, if we don't mind. <laughs> we can do that, too. Um, I am the only county commissioner here today, which is very sad for me. Um, but I, it's hard because Las Cruces, you know, El Paseo Corridor has been overlooked for such a long time now. And giving it the proper infrastructure to help grow and help connect people, especially when you're looking at college students and you're looking at people that are working at the university and how they're growing and connecting them to downtown and connecting them up off of Loman. Um, you know, it's... And I'm of that age where I do believe in connecting people through biking and walking. I, um, I'm kind of leaning towards the public safety look of the city for number two uh, and the county for number three. Because if they only have $40 million for the entire state, the chances of them funding a very large project, um, I just don't see feasible. So that's where I'm kind of landing. But again, with everything that we're going to get next week at my or next meeting, it might change. But that's where I'm falling right now. Thank you, Chairwoman. Wow, Sorry. Just you are the the Katniss Everdeen plot twist <laughs> of this Hunger Games. Yes. Sorry, Councillor. In the Hunger Games, I I just want to mention that if we looked proportionally by 
population, we would expect to get something like 4.15 million uh, from this. So I would say just if, if, and if we get any less than that, then we can cry that the North hates the South. And if we get more than that, then we can further express our dominance over the North. Whatever, whatever, however it works out for us, that should be the marker who, who, of how we Who move brings forward. statistics into this meeting, young lady? Who does that? It's always Councillor Coran. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so unsurprisingly, my two would be city, three would be county for reasons mentioned here. And I was also, when I heard that 40 million, I was also thinking about the possibility of us getting 14 of that feeling a little grim. Uh, Councillor Coran? Same. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so sorry. Yeah. Andrew, seated. were you tallying our... M Madam Chair, we do have a tally and town would be number one, city number two, and county number three. That, okay. And that's what we'll put in the resolution. Um, again, at the next meeting, you can put the county number one, city number two, and mm -hmm. town number three, or however it is that you feel like, but this is just for the purpose of the resolution, but this is what we will put in the resolution, so. Okay, great. And um, perhaps for next meeting as well, I know we can't get a lot of clarity on the state side of things per se, but um, at least uh, I know we had for City of Las Cruces, if we can get a clarification on CIP. Okay, wonderful. And is there, am I forgetting anything else that we had wanted? So just for clarification going off of that as well, Desert Windway did receive 300000 um, in capital outlay money that was dedicated towards it. Mm -hmm. uh, Mo, do you know if there was anything from the previous year for Desert One Way that was allocated? No. So there is 300000 in the pipeline for Desert One Way. Just putting that in the sphere. Thank you. Okay. Um, Dominic or Andrew, anything else that we need to do on this item? Uh, no, Madam Chair, I believe that oh. is it. Uh, once we have the, since we have the ranking, I believe we can move on. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Madam Chair, we will try to track down what additional monies may or may not have been made available, okay. um, and we'll send that out to the board um, uh, when we have it, and it'll be part of the, the next meeting's presentation if we have any additional information. I'm not promising that we will. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. And thank you, colleagues. This was not, not bad. Um, okay, uh, last on our discussion items, and I'm going to take a swing at this one. 8.3, proposed amendment to Mobility 2045, declassification of Zertuce Lane. How close was that? I got, I got other guesses. <laughs> Zertuce is correct. All right, thank you. Uh, Dominic Loy, Frame PO staff, I will be presenting this item. Um, so we were reproached, um, for uh, declassification of Zertucci Lane, um, it is a private road right now. Um, basically, uh, concurrence has been reached between the city of Las Cruces and Doniana County. Uh, it was uh, supposed to be future classified as a collector uh, in the area. Um, the only request Doniana County had was that they wanted to keep it labeled as a uh, major local street. Um, so we'll go ahead and just look at this. So the, this is the whole future thoroughfare plan. Uh, and then we go ahead and go into this. This is in uh, the north, north, actually, I guess, the north part of Cruces, uh, Las Cruces and Doniana County. Uh, so you have Ingler Kennedy right here. This is Elks Drive. Zertucci Lane goes in between Vista Middle School and what used to be Columbia Elementary School. Uh, and then this is, um, oh, I lost the name of it. I'm sorry, this is um, Taylor. Yes, thank you, <laughs> Taylor Road. Um, so basically this is kind of an aerial, aerial view of it. We've got Vista Middle School right here. Uh, then we've got Zertucci Lane that comes down. This is where Columbia used to be. That's now an empty lot uh, and then uh, basically, it comes down through here, and then what it would do is come back out here as a collector. There are a few uh, minor problems with it. The actual right-of-way there is 16 feet. 
There's also a 10 foot easement for El Paso Electric next to it, which makes it look wider than it is, but it is actually only a 16 foot right away. Uh, so as you can see here, this is kind of looking up the street. So this portion right here, this is all within the city. This is the county over here, uh, where you can see the houses. Uh, this neighborhood at the time, I'm gonna guess at the time of annexation, when Vista Middle School was annexed in, uh, did not want to be part of the city of Las Cruces. They wanted to stay within the county. Uh, and then this fence line right here is where Columbia used to be. Uh, and then, then we're looking west here. So as you can see, where this pole is basically, that is within the easement. Um, and uh, there'll be a, no. so this fence line right here actually shows where the end of the right of way is, and it's 16 feet across. Uh, and then you have the extra 10 feet for El Paso Electric. Uh, and it is a private road as of right now. There are signs all over the place out there uh, claiming it to be a private road. Uh, and then this is, of course, looking over at where Columbia used to be. And then this is the middle school, uh, Vista Middle School. Uh, so we've opened a 30-day public comment period on this. Uh, and I will now stand for any questions about this. Questions? So it is currently a private road? It has the brown sign out there uh, stating that it's a private road, and then there are the signs along the road saying this is a private road. Uh, basically, do not drop your children off here. Uh, it's for homeowner use only. So it is a private road? As far as I can tell. <laughs> and doing, doing, looking into the research, it appears to be a private road. Um, but it also does appear to have been dedicated at some point as right of way. And, and when I say some point, I mean like 1920. A few years ago. Yeah, a couple of years back, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so as to how the county and the city view it, uh, like I said, because the, there's two types of street sign. There's the green street sign, which is public, and then there's the brown one, which is private. It has the brown sign saying that it is a private road. Um, as to how much uh, more of that there is, I'm not sure if, if, if Mo could speak on that at all. Um, and that area, and like I said, it goes in and out of the city and county. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the MPO. My name is Ray V. Hill. I represent the Las Cruces Public School District, where we're currently working on the design for the new school that's going to show up there. That road actually is on school property. It resides within school right or property. Just wanted to mention that little detail. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, if I may ask. Yes, questions. Mayor. Um, so what is what are they requesting to declassify it, classify it? What is what is it that you're asking from this board? Uh, so it would be to declassify it. It would no longer be a considered a collector and or a future what would collector. would classify it as? Nothing? Uh, as a major local road. Was, okay. And that would be the counties uh, and the cities uh, for the portions that are within it. Uh, they would basically say this is a local road and it would not uh, be eligible for federal funding. Okay. And the county is okay with that? Madam Chair, Madam Mayor, the road is not in our county. The portion that is not developed is being developed by a developer, and we approach them to become a collector road. But since the city and the school didn't want the portion that is in the city become a collector road, we agreed to let them go because to me, we were worried about this, that, the, that area that is being developed is all residential and they're gonna create a lot of traffic that goes to that school, and we wanted a wider road, safer for the kids, but since the school agrees with the, they don't want, they want it to be just a local road, we're gonna approach the developer again and road the narrow and make it a local road, so. Okay, and so what's before us uh, is to declassify it at this point. Is that correct, Mr. Lloyd? The portion that is in the county, we're going to 
keep it as a local road. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Madam Chair, Mayor Barraza, just a point of clarification. This is not an action item. This is just uh, a discussion today. The, the action item will be at the next month's meeting to, oh, okay. to uh, amend the MTP and declassify it. Okay, so it's just a discussion item. It's just okay. discussion today. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sure. Can Commissioner. we go, so, pardon, can we go back to the map? Uh, would you like the satellite image or the, this? The satellite image. So which part is being developed currently by a developer, you said? This area down in here. West of that, okay. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure if I, may I chair? So declassification, what are all the implications of declassification? Are there any really concrete ones that we could name or um, not? Basically, it would not be eligible, for, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Council Corn. it would not be eligible for federal funding on, in some cases, specifically. Um, that would be about the only thing. Basically, maintenance would fall on whoever, whatever jurisdiction it is within. Um, and depending on if there's grants and stuff that come up, then they could ask for funding for it. But in general, um, there would be no federal funds uh, pushed towards it. In general, though, collectors don't get a lot of federal funds either, so. That wouldn't be a huge change from its existing status. Uh, it, well, its existing status as of right now is future. It okay. is, uh, so it doesn't, it, there's basically, the status is, is that uh, we put the future on there so that when a uh, developer comes in, they know what they have to do based on the different, uh, based on the, city or the county's uh, um, cross sections for specifically for a collector or things like that. Okay, and there are no implications for things like utilities and, and inf other infrastructure development by this decision, right? Not that I know of, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you so much. So at this time, I'll turn it over to my fellow board members. Does anyone have a comment, update, announcement to share? Trustee Johnson Burek. Thank you. I just want to extend a huge thank you to you, Councillor Graham, for uh, stepping up and filling in as chair for me. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. No worries That's at all. all. Thanks for thanks for calling in and being here. Uh, staff comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is Andrew Ray from MPO staff again. I do have one big one. Um, MPO has met with the uh, Las Cruces city manager digitally, um, and the city manager has agreed in principle with the administrative separation of the MPO from the city of Las Cruces, as well as discussed at the. Uh, February meeting of the policy board. Um, the city agrees to remain as the fiscal agent for the MPO. Um, we'll continue to provide all of the provisions that were discussed uh, by the board at the February meeting. The city does intend to assess a fiscal agent fee against the MPO for these services uh, that, that they will continue to provide. Um, and we are currently waiting on what that uh, number is going to be. Um, while we're waiting for that number, I have gone ahead and, and initiated some of the processes that need to be done as far as moving forward with this anyway. Um, I have a lead on a new attorney uh, for, for the MPO following up on that. I've been in touch with the realtor that we were working with last year before we kind of deviated from how I thought the process was going to go. Um, I fully expect to be out in the field uh, examining various potential office locations for MPO at the end of this month or in early May. Um, I'm also going to be uh, making outreach uh, as far as acquiring liability insurance for the MPO. Um, once we get the number for the fiscal agent fee uh, from the city, and I do wanna say that uh, that number from the city does have to be reasonable. 
Uh, there are certain federal constraints on the amount of money that the city can ask as in, in fiscal agent fee. Um, but I think in working with the subcommittee, um, we will do our due diligence to ensure that the city's ask of us is reasonable. Um, but we we do agree that the city is entitled to a fiscal agent fee for the for the services and the changes. Um, but once all that is agreed, and once we have consensus on the totality of the document, um, we will then bring the MOA back to the policy board for a vote um, to initiate the process for moving this forward. At the same time, because of the changes within the MOA, with regards to my status specifically, um, we will have to amend the JPA, as I mentioned in February. I will be working on uh, working with the subcommittee in the very immediate future on the edits to the draft of the JPA. Um, my intention is to consider the MOA and the JPA at the same meeting of the policy board. Once the policy board votes to approve uh, the MOA and the JPA, that will then uh, the JPA will go to the city, the town, and the county. But the MOA itself, as it's a document that is only between the MPO and the City of Las Cruces, the, the MOA will only go to the City of Las Cruces for their approval. Once all of these approvals have been collected, um, the JPA, not the MOA, but the JPA will then go to the State of New Mexico for their approval because according to state law, all JPAs have to be um, blessed and accepted by the state. Um, this is a lot of work. This is a lot of work. And I think I mentioned at the February meeting I was hoping to have all of this done by October the 1st of this year. That's not possible. We're not going to be able to get all of this done uh, by that time. So my hope, um, and again, don't hold me to this. I'm not promising anything. But my hope is that we'll have all the documentation and we will be physically moved by early January of 2024. So I know that a lot big changes that we've been discussing over the past several months, uh, but that concludes my presentation, and I'll stand now for any questions. Questions for Mr. Ray? All right, thank you so much. All right, moving on to public comment, the sequel. Public comment? Still no takers. All right, then at this point, I'd call for a motion for adjournment. So moved. Thank you. Do we have Second. A... Thank you. Moved by Commissioner Sheljo Hernandez, seconded by Trustee Merrick. Madam Chair, you can declare it oh, closed by fiat right. at that point if you want 236, to. 236, we're done. <laughs> Thank you so much.